I've read something from the Mail Online. Right, now this Brady, Brady sent me a, a link to this. And um, it combines all my worst, I don't know, bugbears, all of the things that really irritate me, grind my gears, get me under my, get under my skin. First of all, it's the Daily Mail. That's why I send it to you. Yeah, I know, I know. It's the Daily Mail, which is a bastion of reactionary right of centre uh, news and um, storytelling in, in the UK. The UK would be a hell of a lot better. Britain would be a hell of a lot better if we didn't have a Daily Mail. That's the first thing. Then it's combined with, um, well, as you can see, quantum physics proves that there is an afterlife and claims like, you know, one expert claims he has evidence to confirm an existence beyond the grave and it lies in quantum physics. So now we're getting into the area of quantum physics woo and the whole idea that, you know, there's a, a fantastical element to quantum mechanics. We're all one part of one integrated, interconnected whole. Um, the, the, the weird and wacky and wonderful stuff that, that happens right down at the atomic and molecular level and weird and wacky and wonderful stuff does happen down there somehow magically transmutes or magically you can scale up to the real world so we've got all these fascinating effects happening on sort of everyday length scales. It's really frustrating because this, this doesn't seem to be new stuff. I don't quite know why this has suddenly come to the fore but it's this guy called Robert Lanza. Now Robert Lanza, he's obviously a very clever guy, he's done a lot of really neat work in stem cell research, it seems. I'm not a stem cell researcher so um, I haven't read his work in detail, but what I do know is that he's got no background in, in physics. And of course the usual argument is, well that means that's great because he's coming from left field, he can throw all the establishment ideas away and he'll come up with these radical new ideas. That's sort of like me going, well, you know, I've absolutely no background in surgery, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to go in, I'm going to get in there at the operating table, I'm going to develop some really new techniques. Oh dear, I've made a mess. It's, you know, the, the, the argument that, you know, left of field ideas can come from, you know, very different places than you might expect, that's true. But, you know, what's, what's the quote? Fortune favours the prepared mind. You know, there has to be some level of background there. You, you've, you've got to think about what the, the history of the field has been. You've got to try and work your way through. What he's basically saying is actually not that much different from a book called The Tower of Physics. Um, very famous book. It's been out there now, I guess, since the 70s. I can't quite remember. Maybe even the 60s. And what it does is it connects new age ideas, sort of Eastern mysticism with quantum mechanics and quantum physics. The idea that, you know, quantum physics means that there's an interconnectedness to all things and with there's a universal spirit, etc. All these type of things, which are deeply, deeply frustrating because you know, quantum physics really says no such thing at all. And um, what Lance has done is he's gone a little bit further and he's basically taken the old idea of um, the observer affecting a measurement or the observer affecting an object to say that actually there is no... Um, objective reality out there. There is no universe that out there. It's our consciousness, it's our biochemistry that creates the universe. Ah, I need a bit of deep breath because it, it, it is frustrating. Ah, how can I put it? Awful lot of nonsense in this. Let's be sympathetic for a minute. What has the world of quantum mechanics and physicists done wrong that allows people to start making these connections that you think are spurious? That's a really great question and I think I'm as guilty of this as everyone else because when you're down at the atomic molecular single particle level weird things do happen, things that we don't understand but because we don't understand them doesn't mean we can just make up any nonsense. We can't just say right, we don't understand some aspect of quantum mechanics and then I don't know that's because invisible pixies which are undetectable to us are popping in and out of existence and affecting the forces between these particles. We don't have a license to just make up bull. Problem is all the weird and wacky stuff that happens at the atomic molecular level like particles have this du dual or schizophrenic character where they have um, behave like waves. You know we haven't got to the bottom of that. We, re we really don't understand what's going on there. In particular something called quantum entanglement where you know which um, lands a describes at, at, at length and he's right in that it is weird and it is strange in that you get two particles you couple them together in some weird state it's called an entangled state I'm not going to go into details for the physicists among you you you, you know it's all about spin and all that type of thing but um, you you couple them in, in, in some state called an entangled state. That's all we need to go into. You send one particle to one end of the universe, if the universe is ends, the other particle to the other end of the universe. You make a measurement on this one, and here's the, the weird bit, the bit that cause, causes so many physicists so many sleepless nights. 
is that you make a measurement in this one and this one responds instantaneously, not at the speed of light, instantaneously. There's clearly something you know, that we're lacking there. We don't understand that it's a remarkable effect, but physicists work extremely hard to try and see these effects. They, ultra high vacuums and very, very, very low temperatures, those type of effects do not scale up to the macroscopic world. The reason all this quantum weirdness, we don't see it in the macroscopic world. You know, I don't diffract um, like a wave when I go through a door. Um, Brady is, is a fairly solid object in front of me. It's, you know, it doesn't seem to have wave-like characteristics at all. And that's because we interact with it. Ultimately, it's because we interact with our environment. And that doesn't require consciousness. It's just, you know, it's just the very fact that these waves, these quantum waves are getting scattered of, of objects. That's enough. We don't need a consciousness to be an observer. And that's one of the difficulties with this, is the um, sort of anthropomorphic uh, aspect of this, is that you're assuming that nature, um, that, that reality has to be observed by a conscious observer to, to create this stuff. To come back to your question, Brady, which is a great question, you know, to be fair, we're so desperate to put across, look at how weird and wonderful this stuff is. It's, it's, it's fascinating, and it is fascinating. But the difficulty is, is that sometimes that's misinterpreted. And um, quite how we get beyond that, quite how we maintain, look, look at how exciting this is, and yet get across the, well, actually, you've got to be very careful before you extend this to larger scales. Physicists are very guilty, for various reasons, of borrowing language from the macroscopic world to describe this world, don't they? You know, we talk about colours and flavours of quarks, and, we talk, and you, you, you borrow all this language to help people understand. Yeah, and then it's misinterpreted. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, quark is actually a pretty good one, because that's a, I, I would argue that's a, you know, a, a otherworldly word. It doesn't connect really to the, 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 the world around us. Colour is a problem, but one of the things... Um, spin is a problem. Spin is a big problem, because spin is, is not spin. That's, that's the difficulty. It's not spin as we think it, because um, if you do the calculation, it turns out that if spin at the quantum level was actually spin, things would be p spinning around at so many times the, the speed of light. So it's, yeah, the, it, it is a problem. What's, thank you, Brady, and we didn't even prepare this at all. So I've been reading this. This is Pauli's exclusion principle, which um, it's remarkable. You can see it's the origin and validation of a scientific principle. And um, it, this principle, I'm not going to go into it, but it's to do with spin. And actually, without this principle, we wouldn't have a periodic table. But it's absolutely remarkable because Pauli didn't introduce it as spin. He called it something I translate vaguely from the German, something along the lines of a two-valued electron thing. And that eventually became spin. Um, and um, it's not quite spin. It's definitely not spin. It's a, I think most physicists would think of it as a, it's a, it's a property of an electron, and we label it as plus or minus a half, but actually what it physically represents is something very, very difficult indeed. Lanza it basically exploits that, I would say. There's a, another line in this Daily Mail article. Lanza uses the example of the way we perceive the world around us. A person sees a blue sky, sky and is told that the colour they are seeing is blue, but the cells in the person's brain could be changed to make the sky look green or red. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. I'm not an expert in the biochemistry, but yeah, I can see how that might be the case. But that's like arguing that there isn't an objective colour there. But we can measure an objective colour because we know the wavelength, or we can measure the wavelength of the light. That might, our brains might perceive that as red or green or blue or whatever, but we know what that wavelength is or what the frequency of that light is. So there is an objective colour there. And it's this mixing of, you know, quantum ideas with the idea of what is subjective and what is objective. I guess that makes this, for a physicist, so painful to read, but for others who don't, you know, don't have the background in physics, they read this and go, well, he's using lots of big words here. Physicists use those same type of big words. Then, therefore, I, I don't want to sound too patronizing, but you know, th there could be an argument, well, you know, the language there seems to be the language of a physicist, so maybe he's, um, maybe he's onto something here. And when you couple that with, a, you know, he's coming from left field, he has no training in physics, it, it's, it's really, oh, it's, it's really a neat story. It's a compelling story in terms of the loner really battling against the system to show that he's got a wonderful new, um, out, you know, out of left field theory. Why does it matter? Because no physicist is going to accept this, and he hasn't said anything that's going to make the average reader go and jump off a cliff or do something stupid. Why does it matter that some people think that maybe 
a misguided article is accurate? Because it changes the perception of physics. It changes the perception of the world around us. And my job as a physicist and everyone's job as a physicist is to understand the world around us. And moreover, we're funded. We're funded by the public. The reason we do these videos, the reason we produce papers is to disseminate our work, to say, look, this is the way the world is. And that's why it hacks off so many physicists is because it's false. It's just fundamentally wrong. It's like, I don't know, it's, you, you're a journalist, Brady. It's like somebody coming up, you, you work really, really hard to you know, get the detail of a story and um, tell that as accurately as possible. And then some, likely in the Daily Mail, journalist comes along and um, gives a completely distorted version of the facts. It would, it would hack you off. And um, for physicists, it's, it's not only dangerous from that perspective in terms of the overall public perception, it's also dangerous in terms of you know, where how politicians view what's, what's happening. Because, you know, politicians who are, in many cases, don't have a strong scientific background, may well read this and think, oh, wow. And if they've got any sort of um, influence, I guess, on the funding system and the funding ecosystem, if you want to call it that, then, you know, this could direct funding away from something which is a hell of a lot more valuable into this, this type of nonsense. In this particular system, you can't, it doesn't work for this system and it doesn't work for so many systems because what you have to do is to have a limit, to have an upper limit on the total amount of energy you can have.